example of how dangerous a headmistress could be on the very next day. During lunch, an announcement was made that the whole school should go into the assembly hall and be seated as soon as the meal was over. When all the 250 or so boys and girls were settled down in assembly, the trunchbull marched onto the platform. None of the other teachers came with her. She was carrying a riding crop in her right hand. She stood up there on centre stage in her green breeches with legs apart and riding crop in hand, glaring at the sea of upturned faces before her. What's going to happen? I don't know. Bruce Bogtrotter! Where is Bruce Bogtrotter? A hand shot up among the seated children. Come up here! I look smart about it! An eleven-year-old boy, who was decidedly large and round, stood up and waddled briskly forward. He climbed up onto the platform. Stand over there! The boy stood to one side. He looked nervous. He knew very well he wasn't up there to be presented with a prize. He was watching the headmistress with an exceedingly wearing eye and he kept edging farther and farther away from her with little shuffles of his feet, rather as a mitt, rather as a rat may edge away from a terrier that is watching it from across the room. His plump, flabby face had turned grey with fearful apprehension. His stockings hung about his ankles. This clot, this blackhead, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule that you see before you is none other than a disgusting criminal, a denizen of the underworld, a member of the mafia. A thief? A thief! A crook! A pirate! A brigand! A brigand! A rustler! Steady on. I mean, dash it all, headmistress. Do you deny it, you miserable little gumboil? Do you plead not guilty? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you what I'm talking about, you suppurating little bl blister. Yesterday morning, during break, you sneaked like a little serpent into the kitchen and stole a slice of my private chocolate cake from my tea tray. That tray had just been prepared for me personally by the cook. It was my morning snack, and as for the cake, it was my own private stock. That's not... Boy, that was that was not boy's cake. You don't think of one. You don't think for one minute I am going to eat the filth I give to you. That cake was made from real butter and real cream. And he, that robber bandit, that safe cracker, that highway man standing over there with his socks around his ankles, stole it and ate it. I never did. Don't lie to me, Bob Trotter. The cook saw you. What's more, she saw you eating it. The trunchbull paused to wipe a fleck of froth from her lips. When she spoke again, her voice was suddenly softer, quieter, more friendly, and she leaned towards the boy, smiling. You like my special chocolate cake, don't you, Bob Trotter? It's rich and delicious, isn't it, Bob Trotter? Very good. You're right. It is very good. Therefore, I think you should congratulate the cook. When a gentleman has had a particularly good meal, Bob Trotter, he always sends his compliments to the chef. You didn't know that, did you, Bob Trotter? But those who inhabit the criminal underworld are not noted for their good manners. The boy remained silent. Cook! Come here, cook! Bob Trotter wishes to tell you how good your chocolate cake is. The cook, a tall, shriveled female who looked as though all of her body juices had been dried out of her long ago in a hot oven, walked onto the platform wearing a dirty white apron. Her entrance had clearly been arranged beforehand by the headmistress. Now then, Bob Trotter, tell cook what you think of the chocolate cake. Very good. You could see he was now beginning to wonder what all this was leading up to. The only thing he knew for certain was that the law forbade the trunchbull to hit him with the riding crop that she kept smacking against her thigh.
That was some comfort, but not much because the trench ball was totally unpredictable. One never knew what she was going to do next. There you are, Cook. Bob Trotter likes your cake. He adores your cake. Do you have, do you have any more of your cake oh. that you could give him? Yes, I do. Then go and get it and bring a knife to cut it with. <laughs> The cook disappeared. Almost at once she was fatter. The cake was fully 18 inches in diameter and it was covered with dark brown chocolate icing. What's on the table? There was a small table centre stage with a chair behind it. The cook placed the cake carefully on the table. Sit down, Bob Trotter. Sit there. The boy moved cautiously to the table and sat down. He stared at the gigantic cake. There you are, Bob Trotter. It's all for you, every bit of it. As you enjoyed that slice you had yesterday so very much, I ordered Cook to bake you an extra large one all for yourself. Well, thank you. Thank Cook, not me. Thank you, Cook. The Cook stood there like a shriveled bootlace, tight lipped. Implacable, implacable, disapproving. She looked as though her mouth was full of lemon juice. Come on then, why don't you cut it for you cut yourself a nice thick slice and try it? What now? Can't I take it home instead? That would be impolite. You must show Cookie, I hear, how grateful you are for all the trouble she's taken. The boy didn't move. Go on, get on with it. Cut the slice and taste it. We haven't got all day. The boy picked up the knife and was about to cut into the cake when he stopped. He stared at the cake. Then he looked up at the trunch bowl. Then at the tall stringy cook with her lemon juice mouth. All the children in the hall were watching tensely, waiting for something to happen. They felt certain it must. The trunch bowl was not a person who would just give someone a whole chocolate cake to eat just out of kindness. Many were guessing that it had been filled with pepper or castor oil or some other foul tasting substance that would make the boy violently sick. It might even be arsenic and he would be dead in 10 seconds flat. Or perhaps it was a booby trapped cake and the whole thing would blow up the moment it was cut taking Bruce Bogtrotter with it. No one in the school put it past the trunch bowl to do any of these things. Don't want to eat it. Taste it, you little brat. You're insulting the cook. Very gingerly, the boy began to cut a thin slice of the vast cake. Then he levered the slice out. Then he put down the knife and took the sticky thing in his finger and started very slowly to eat it. It's good, isn't it? Very good. Have another. That's enough, thank you. I said have another. Eat another slice! Do as you're told! I don't want another slice! Eat! If I tell you to eat, you will eat! You wanted cake, you stole cake, and now you've got cake! What's more, you're going to eat it! You do not leave this platform and nobody leaves this hall until you've eaten the entire cake that is sitting there in front of you! Do I make myself clear, Bob Trotter? Do you get my meaning? The boy looked at the trunch bowl. Then he looked down at the enormous cake. Eat! 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 Very slowly, the boy cut himself another slice and began to eat it. Matilda was fascinated. Do you think he can do it? No, it's impossible. He'd be sick before he was halfway through it. The boy kept going. When he had finished the second slice, he looked at the trunch bowl, hesitating. Eat! Green little thing, green little thieves who like to eat cake must have cake. Eat faster, boy. Eat faster. We don't want to be here all day and don't stop like you're doing now. Next time you stop before it's all finished, you'll go straight to the chokey and I shall lock the door and throw the key down the well. The boy cut a third slice and started to eat it. He finished this one quicker than the other two and when that was done, he immediately picked up the knife and cut the next slice. In some peculiar way, he seemed to be getting into his stride. Matilda, 
watching closely, saw no signs of distress in the boy yet. If anything, he seemed to be gathering confidence as he went along. He seems to be doing well. He'll be sick soon. It's going to be horrid. When Bruce, Bruce Bogtrotter had it, eaten his way through half of the entire enormous cake, he paused for just a couple of seconds and took several deep breaths. The Trunchbull stood with hands on hips, glaring at him. Get on with it! Eat it all! Suddenly, the boy let out a gigantic belch, which, <laughs> which rolled around the assembly hall like thunder. Silence! The boy cut himself another thick slice and started eating it fast. There were still no signs of flagging or giving up. He certainly did not look as though he was about to stop and cry out. I can't. I can't eat anymore. I'm going to be sick. He was still in there running. And now a subtle change was coming over the 250 watching children in the audience. Earlier on, they had, they had sensed impending disaster. They had prepared themselves for an unpleasant scene in which the wretched boy, stuffed to the gills with chocolate cake, would have to surrender and beg for mercy. And then they would have watched the triumphant Trunchbull forcing more and still more cake into the mouth of the gasping boy. Not a bit of it. Bruce Bogtrotter was three quarters of the way through and still going strong. One sensed that he, had almost he was almost beginning to enjoy himself. He had a mountain to climb and he was jolly. Well, going to reach the top or die in the attempt. What is more... He had now become very conscious of his audience and of how they were all silently rooting for him. This was nothing less than a battle between him and the mighty Trunchbull. Suddenly, someone shouted, Come on, Brucey! You can make it! Silence! The audience watched intently. They were thoroughly caught up in the contest. They were longing to start cheering, but they didn't dare. I think he's going to make it. Trunchbull doesn't believe it either. Look at her. She's turning redder and redder. He's going to kill him if he wins. The boy was slowing down now. There was no doubt about that. But he kept pushing the stuff into his mouth with the dogged perseverance of a long distance runner who, was, who has sighted the finishing line and knows he must keep going. As the very last mouthful disappeared, a tremendous cheer rose up from the audience and Yay! Children were leaping onto their chairs and yelling and clapping and shouting. Well done, Brucey! Good for you, Brucey! You've won a gold medal, Brucey! The Trunchbull stood motionless on the platform. Her great, horsey face had turned the colour of molten lava and her eyes were glittering with fury. She glared at Bruce Bogtrotter, who was sitting on his chair like some huge, overstuffed grub, replete, comatose, Unable to move or to speak, a fine sweat was beading his forehead, but there was a grin of triumph on his face. Suddenly, the Trunchbull lunged forward and grabbed the large, empty china platter on which the cake had rested. She, ha she raised it high into the air and brought it down with a crash right on the top of the wretched Bruce Bogtrotter's head and pieces flew all over the platform. The boy was now so full of cake, he was like a sack full of wet cement and you couldn't have hurt him with a sledgehammer. He simply shook his head a few times and went on grinning. Caught to blazes! Screamed the Trunchbull and she marched off the platform, followed closely by the cop. Oh! 